Live, we're going to be sharing uh, kind of what we did, uh, what our goals are and our plans and some of our initial data and trying to leave lots of time for, for uh, questions and feedback. Um, so I'm here uh, on behalf of myself and uh, Alan Gerber, uh, who is here as well. And uh, Alan's going to jump in uh, for the Q&A portion. Um, and again, I just want to thank uh, the OVPR and IDM for, uh, for funding this study. Uh, it's called the Pixie Study, Psychosocial Impact of COVID-19 Induced Social Isolation. We actually, I meant to find it. Uh, we actually had some of our, uh, our autistic um, participants uh, do a um, uh, online uh, art contest where one of them made the Pixie Pixie uh, who shows up on all of our materials. Uh, I, I unfortunately, wasn't able to show her. Anyway, so let's dive in. Uh, so... <clears throat> Mandated quarantine, uh, which is, of, uh, of course, an essential step in the mitigation of the spread of COVID-19, uh, can lead to considerable negative psychosocial uh, and psychological effects uh, for those who are impacted by that quarantine and can have wide-reaching public health implications. Um, in fact, social isolation and loneliness already represent uh, high priority public health concerns even before the pandemic. NIH was putting out uh, specialized calls for grants related to this topic. Little did they know. <laughs> and it's associated with a uh, risk of uh, poor mental and physical as well as health outcomes as well as mortality. Now youth with autism spectrum disorder are already at considerable risk for uh, experiencing elevated levels of social isolation and loneliness. Uh, and they're uniquely vulnerable to the impacts then of mandated social isolation. That is, their social opportunities are already fewer and now they get uh, further, you know, further reduced associated with this. Additionally, um, folks with ASD already have a very high service utilization, uh, which then gets impacted, significant uh, unmet care and, uh, and education needs, and ex uh, their families are known to experience uh, very high levels of family stress. So uh, all of these are exacerbated uh, in the face of COVID. Um, and on top of this, you know, this, we're talking here about kind of the move into isolation. They also potentially face starkly different outcomes when they return from isolation. For instance, returning to school because uh, typically developing kids may have uh, rich social networks into which to reintegrate themselves. Uh, those with ASD, uh, many of them lack that. Most of them lack that to begin with. So our big uh, unanswered question here is how has the social isolation of COVID-19 impacted the psychosocial well-being of youth with ASD and their families? So for this study, uh, we recruited participants uh, through my existing participant pool, and we only enrolled participants who had already come in for other studies in the lab and at least completed an initial visit. This was really helpful because it means we, our sample is really kind of richly characterized and deeply phenotyped. We have uh, brain imaging data, cognitive data, behavioral data, various different kinds uh, on these people, uh, on these participants already. So we were able to recruit uh, 76 uh, participants of whom uh, 51 um, uh, had a, a clinically confirmed a, re a research reliable uh, autism diagnosis. And um, these are their baseline scores on some of all these other scales. Essentially they you know, did meet criteria for ASD on multiple measures. Um, and we looked at several of these other outcomes. Um, and then, uh, Recruitment for the study began in June 1st, as I'll uh, explain um, uh, in a little bit more detail soon in a moment. And essentially, we had uh, participants uh, fill out reports for us uh, every two weeks for six months. And um, the parents completed measures of autism symptoms, of the impact of social isolation um, on families, uh, called the measure called the EPI that was developed in response to the COVID pandemic. And we uh, also looked at their actual social behavior in that intervening two weeks. And we're gonna dive into that a lot uh, in a moment. We also, uh, just like uh, doctors uh, Malik and Opara looked at uh, internalizing symptoms, anxiety and depression, as well as parenting stress and loneliness. Um, and uh, parents were compensated uh, for their time based on completion in each outcome. So what essentially happened is beginning in June, we asked them retrospective questions, said, think back to March and tell us a little bit about what your social behavior was like in March on our SII measure, social interaction measure. Then we said, okay, now look around today and tell us about what you're doing and then 
complete the rest of these measures. And then we had them do it every two weeks all the way through the summer. Uh, this was midpoint. And then right after midpoint was, uh, this was intentionally timed this way, the beginning of school, so that we can look at whether or not there are any discontinuous jumps in any of these uh, phenomena once they return to school. Many of the districts out here, as, as we know, kids return to school in person, but even if they didn't, they were still uh, having a mandatory interaction of some kind uh, with peers beginning then. And this went all the way through December. So, you know, we believe that this uh, research had uh, uh, fairly, has fairly significant uh, public health impacts. Again, this, this gives us a lot of insight about social isolation and loneliness in particular. Uh, we also are looking at a uniquely vulnerable population. This is a population that already experiences social isolation and this is now amping that up even further. Uh, we're looking at, they also have very high rates of internalizing symptoms to begin with. So this is really kind of an en enriched sample for many of the outcomes we're, we're, we're interested in, uh, including parenting stress. And again, as I mentioned, there's unmet uh, service needs. And finally, uh, uh, this research gives us an opportunity to test some really fundamental uh, implicit theories of autism that, um, that, that really we couldn't otherwise test. For instance, one of the big going theories in the scientific literature about ASD has to do with sort of motivation to interact. Um, but the challenge is that uh, usually in life, you don't reduce the opportunities for interaction. Uh, you wouldn't do that to somebody, it would be unethical. And so it becomes very difficult to suss out, well, is this person you know, interacting with others or not because they're less motivated or because uh, they have fewer opportunities or vice versa. Well, this suddenly kind of sets everyone at a level playing field and allows us to test some fundamental assumptions. So we had a, have a great research team here. So uh, there's myself, uh, Dr. Jennifer Kalusker, who's now an uh, adjunct uh, assistant professor in the Department of, of Psychiatry here, and Alan Gerber, uh, my phenomenal graduate student who really did uh, the heavy lifting on a lot of what you're gonna see here. He's got uh, a lot uh, to share too. Um, we also have a great research staff who did uh, all of the follow-ups of all of these families, uh, wonderful PhD students. And we actually, I just wanna do a quick, quick pitch for our clinical care coordinator. So the Autism Initiative, which is a service that uh, we is offered to the entire university. Uh, we have a, a social worker uh, named Kate Emott, who um, can meet with families of youth with ASD to provide clinical support. So she actually was available to every family in the study uh, if they had clinical needs. So let's take a look a little bit at what we, uh, what we found. Um, so uh, I'm gonna break out some of this data uh, as we go. So this is um, the retro, this line just to orient you every time, this blue line is the beginning of data collection in June. So this is their retrospective report of amount of social interaction on uh, summed across this measure that we uh, developed um, before the pandemic. This is uh, beginning week one, and then this is every week thereafter. And then this blue line over here will always represent in these data, the return to school. They're in the midpoint of the survey. And so uh, one thing we're seeing here is that right from the beginning, at least according to parent report, uh, these kids are, um, the typically developing kids are having more social interaction to begin with. And that kind of stays fairly stably so throughout the group, uh, throughout, throughout uh, uh, the, the weeks, um, kind of remarkably so. We also looked at loneliness. So again, same thing, this is midpoint. We don't have retrospective data um, on, on loneliness. And what we see is that the kids with ASD uh, report being more lonely at that very first time point, at the beginning of the pandemic. And then the group seemed to kind of come together over time. And again, obviously we're gonna be looking at this statistically and uh, this is just our, our first pass at the, at the data. Um, and we see this phenomenon exists both in overall loneliness and then also in clinical loneliness. So uh, this particular measure, the UCLA loneliness scale has a clinical cutoff for uh, basically clinically elevated loneliness. And what we find is that uh, uh, almost 55% of youth with ASD um, were uh, reported being uh, clinically lonely at baseline, whereas only uh, oh, half that reported being clinically lonely at baseline in the typically developing sample. But then they, they kind of met up over time. Interestingly though, youth with ASD seem to report increased or at least stable loneliness once they return to school, whereas typically developing kids 
it, their trajectory appears to be going in the other direction, again, suggesting that perhaps these kids, typically developing kids are kind of uptaking these social opportunities when they come back, they're reintegrating socially, um, whereas the ASD kids might not be. And this, uh, I know it's hard to see, so I'm just gonna orient you, I'm just gonna describe to you uh, the, the data points are small. Um, so this is the whole sample broken out by baseline clinical loneliness. So this panel over here, everybody reported not being clinically lonely at baseline. This panel over here, they did report being clinically lonely. And what we see is that uh, over the course of the whole six months, um, the typically developing kids who are not lonely and the kids with ASD who are not lonely at baseline are fairly similar, maybe a little bit different in terms of their uh, social interaction. But what really jumped out at us, and really, again, is sort of the direction we're going with some of these analyses now, is that in the clinically lonely group, the typically developing kids, uh, uh, in terms of their social interaction, are just sky high, much more, uh, engaging in much more than the kids with ASD, uh, suggesting that perhaps they are um, able to switch into the sort of digital mode of interaction uh, that many kids are, 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 that many of us had to engage in to compensate for their loneliness um, once the pandemic hit and once they had to, to do that. Whereas those who are clinically lonely and had autism don't look very different than those who are not clinically lonely. And so to explore this, we kind of zoomed in on the type of social interaction they're engaged in. So again, um, this, is, uh, this is, you don't have to, read this deeply, I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, these are the different specific behaviors that can constitute social interaction. So we've got, for instance, being in class. Uh, not surprisingly, it went down over the summer and then they get back to school and thankfully those numbers jump up. Uh, this is being in class alone, being in class with others. Again, the numbers jump up, this is good. This shows us they're actually telling us probably the truth. Uh, same thing with doing schoolwork. Oops. Uh, uh, you know, lower over the summer and then jumps up. Eating, but again, not very different really across the groups. Um, same thing with eating alone versus eating with others. Reading alone, reading with others. These are all pretty much the same, whether or not you have autism. Being outside alone, being outside with others. Playing board games alone, playing board games with others. But what really was interesting is this. So this is social media use of various kinds, digital media use. So the typically developing youth are engaged, you can see these red bars almost exclusively on this whole page are all above the blue ones, right? So we're seeing that whether they're alone or with other people in the room, typically developing kids are engaging in more social media use, more phone use, uh, more video chatting, and more messaging like instant messenger or Facebook messenger than uh, the, to the kids with that with ASD. And we're finding as well uh, then we, if we switch to um, impact on mental health, uh, in, interestingly, we don't see uh, as substantial separation in terms of, of depression, uh, for example, um, except, except when they return to school. Again, you see this really interesting drop off in depression when, when these typically developing kids are going back to school and getting, you know, perhaps seeing their peers again, we're not seeing that in ASD. And we see the same phenomenon and anxiety. Um, sadly, this, this, this is pretty stable and pretty consistent. This is parent report of their own pessimism this is sky high in the, typically in the kids with, parents of kids with ASD, much lower in typically developing kids. And same thing with reports of parent and family problems, which again, you know, high and stable, but uh, consistent uh, with, the, with, with the known literature. So, um, we want to play with these data and we want to play with them with you. So uh, please feel free uh, to join us. They really, they're, we're just beginning to, uh, to dip into the tip of the iceberg. That's a real mixed metaphor. Anyway, the point is we're just beginning to really dive into these data. So we would love to collaborate with folks who have interesting ideas about data analysis, particularly in longitudinal and lag type analysis, as well as data integration. We have quite a lot of, as I said, other data uh, behavioral and electrophysiological data, for instance, that we can use to say predict risk uh, for uh, some of the negative outcomes that we're seeing over time. Uh, we're also interested um, if, if folks are interested in collaborating to on grants to say add in physiological measures. Obviously this is post hoc, so we would either need measures that we really expect to be different as a result of 
pandemic behavior or really stable measures. So we're thinking about things like cortisol, eye tracking to social stimuli, fMRI, sleep behavior, uh, as well as potentially um, uh, a recording of, of uh, genetic data uh, to look at maybe polygenic risk scores for uh, uh, response to um, adverse response to uh, the pandemic. And of course, we're open to others. So again, as I mentioned, we have a unique sample here of, of youth with ASD. As far as I know, and I know, I know most of the other investigators in the country who have tried to do studies like this, uh, there, ours is pretty unique. I don't think anybody else I've been able to find has been able to repeatedly and intensively sample this a population characterized this way as much as we have here. And again, this gives us kind of a natural experiment to test some fundamental assumptions about autism. We can use this to identify individuals at risk um, uh, for some adverse outcomes, as well as develop uh, targeted telehealth approaches. And so just as a quick note, uh, we are trying to, we are throwing these data uh, towards uh, to build additional funding. The Autism Science Foundation has specific COVID-19 grants. Uh, there's one due next month, which we are currently working on and uh, which would uh, allow us to extend uh, the follow-up and expand data collection on this sample to sort of keep looking at them as we move into this next year and see how they're doing. Uh, the Simons Foundation has a large autism grant relative to, to this topic due in May, which we're working to prepare based on the sample. And NIMH uh, has a, a targeted uh, funding opportunity in June that we're aiming for as well. So that is, uh, I think we got, I kept it just about to 15 minutes. So yeah. hopefully plenty of time.